I'm Justin McBrayer, philosopher from the United States. I teach at the Public Liberal Arts College for the state of Colorado. And today I'll be speaking with you about the so-called problem of evil, an argument for atheism, an argument against the existence of God. And I'd like to open by having you think about a case that might be parallel to God in a particular kind of way. Imagine you were asked to think about extraterrestrials, beings that live somewhere off of Earth. Are there such things as extraterrestrials? Well, you could believe that there are extraterrestrials. You could believe that there are not extraterrestrials. And then you could be in between. You could be agnostic. And agnostic in this case is someone who doesn't believe that there is life elsewhere in the universe, but it's also someone who does not deny that there's life elsewhere in the universe. The agnostic is the person that just doesn't know one way or the other. And it seems like when it comes to life elsewhere in the universe, that's the reasonable position to take. To think that there is life elsewhere in the universe, you'd have to have some kind of evidence, some kind of reason, some kind of argument to think that there's life beyond Earth. Similarly, to think that there's not any life outside of Earth, not life elsewhere in the universe, again, it seems like you would need some kind of evidence, some kind of reason, some kind of argument. So it seems that agnosticism, if you will, is the kind of default position. We just can't tell yet whether or not there's life elsewhere. The same might be said when it comes to the case of God. People who believe that there is a God are theists. Theists are people who have a particular belief. They believe that there is a being in the universe that answers to the concept of God. On the other hand, people who are atheists are people who deny the truth of theism. They deny that there is a being in the universe that answers to the concept of God. So atheists, like theists, have a particular belief about God. They believe that there is no such being. Agnostics, on the other hand, are somewhere in between. Agnostics are those who don't believe that there is a God, but also don't believe that there's not a God. They're somewhere in between. And just like aliens or extraterrestrials, if you believe that there is a God, or if you believe that there's not a God, it seems that you need a reason, some kind of argument or some kind of evidence to push you one way or the other. The default position when it comes to God is to be an agnostic. So no one's born a theist, and no one's born an atheist. All of us are agnostics, trying to sort out the best reasons that we might have for going one way or going the other. Now, let me offer briefly a sense of what I mean when I use the term God. By the term God, what I mean is a being that's perfect in every way that he could possibly be. So I mean a being that's perfect in power, a being that's capable of doing anything there is that could be done, a being that's perfect in love, a being that's perfect in ethics, if you will, a being that's omnibenevolent. He will always do the right thing, always do the good thing. So when I say God, I don't just mean some kind of higher power or some kind of divine being. I don't mean, for example, to refer to a being like Zeus, who's divine by some measure, but wouldn't count as God. It's this idea of a perfect being that's encapsulated in some of the major world religions, religions like Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and so forth. It's that kind of being. Theists think that there is such a being. Atheists think that there's not such a being. Agnostics are somewhere in between. They don't think there is and yet they don't think that there isn't either. So just as with aliens or extraterrestrials, we would need some kind of reason to endorse a theism or atheism. What might such a reason be when it comes to the existence of God? Well, historically, one of the most important arguments for atheism is what's been called the problem of evil or the argument from evil. Now, the argument from evil is um, any number of an of a instance of argument that starts with a premise or an assumption about the existence of evil and has as its conclusion a claim that there is no such thing as God, that God does not exist. So the problem of evil is roughly the problem of trying to reconcile the existence of terrible things in the world with the existence of a perfect being. 
here in Edinburgh, David Hume put the problem this way. Is God willing to prevent evil, but not able? If so, he's impotent. He lacks power. Is he able, but not willing? Then he's malevolent. He's an evil being if he's able to prevent evil, but doesn't do so. Is God both able and willing? And if so, whence the evil? How did we get an evil world if God could stop evil, he's all powerful, and God wants to stop evil, he's all good? It seems that with a combination of both of those things, the world wouldn't experience the kind of evils that it does. And yet, given the presence of evil, that seems like a powerful reason to leave agnosticism and become an atheist. So, just as we need some kind of argument, some kind of evidence to leverage us off of the agnostic position and onto the atheist position, the problem of evil seems to be one of the best candidates for powerful evidence for atheism. Now, quickly, I want to say something about what might count as evil. Evil, as I'm using it in this talk, just refers to any way in which the world might be bad. This could refer to particular types of evil. So for example, childhood cancer. It could refer to the distribution of evil. For example, the fact that sometimes good people suffer and evil people flourish. Or it could just be the existence of evil in general. The fact that there are evil things is somehow incompatible with the existence of God. So when I use the term evil, I mean it to stand in for any number of ways in which the world on its face could be better. And the idea is very simple then. Suppose someone built you a house and you went to the house and it was of shoddy construction. The doors didn't work, it was poorly insulated and so forth. You would be right to conclude that your house was not designed by a good architect. The example again is David Hume's. He said, just as you might conclude, that the house was constructed by a bad architect, when you look at our world full of all kind of evils, all kind, there are all kind of ways the world could have been better, you shouldn't think that it was made by an all-powerful, all-good creator. You should think it was made at best by some lesser deity. In other words, our world constitutes evidence against the existence of God. Now, this isn't enough in this quote form to generate a kind of argument or a reason. Philosophers like really clear reasons and clear arguments for their conclusions. But we can take Hume's insight and we can put it in a very simple argument form. And here's what the argument looks like. It has two assumptions, premises, one conclusion. The first assumption says this, if God exists, then there's no evil in the world. In other words, the existence of this all-good, all-knowing, all-benevolent being is sufficient to ensure that whatever kind of created order there is, it will be devoid of evil. Premise 2 says this, but there is evil in the world. And the conclusion from 1 and 2 is that God does not exist. Now briefly, the defense of each premise is as follows. The idea is that God, being perfectly powerful, perfectly able, and perfectly willing to eliminate evil, would do so. Hence, if there's a God, there would be no evil. But, premise two, look at the world that we live in, where children die horrible deaths, where there are things like holocausts, and tsunamis, and human suffering, and suicide. Our world is filled with all sorts of evils. And so the conclusion, three, God does not exist. Now this argument is valid. What that means is if the two premises are true, then the conclusion follows as a matter of logic. The conclusion has to be true as well. So I invite you to take a look at this argument. It's valid. So if the argument makes a mistake, it has to make a mistake in either premise one or premise two. Take a moment and look at this argument and think carefully about it. Do you think premise one is true? Do you think premise two is true? Do you think that either of these assumptions are false? And if you think one is false, 
Ask yourself why. Pause the video, think about that for a moment, and then we'll be right back. So what do you think? Is this a good reason to be an atheist? Is this a good reason for moving ourselves out of the agnostic camp about God and into the atheist camp about God? Well, you might have come up with an objection or two. Here are two of the most popular objections to this way of phrasing the problem of evil. The first objection is that maybe there's no such thing as evil. Some people are very tempted to this line of thinking. They think maybe evil is just something that humans invented. It's a word that describes things that we don't like, but maybe not things that are objectively bad or evil. And if it's merely describing our, our preferences for particular things, maybe that's not the sort of thing that God would pay attention to. So if the second assumption of the argument is a mistake, if it's false, then of course that's not a good reason to be an atheist. So if you're tempted to think that morality is a sham or that there's no such thing as, as good or evil, that's fine. But then you can't use the existence of evil in the world as a reason to be an atheist. You'll need some other kind of reason. Now historically, some philosophers have taken that line of thought seriously. In particular, a philosopher by the name of Spinoza, who is a continental philosopher during the early modern period. But by and large, philosophers take seriously the idea that there's a moral realm, that there are things that are good and there are things that are bad. And if you take that seriously, then you can't evade this argument by rejecting the second premise. What else might you do? The second objection targets the first premise. Maybe it's true that sometimes evil is necessary for good. Maybe there are some goods that you just can't get without evils. Here's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. It would be impossible for God to create a square circle. Given what a square is, it can't also be a circle. It would be impossible for God to create mountains without valleys. It would be impossible for him to create mothers without children. These things are logically coupled such that one is a counterpart of the other. It's impossible to have the one and not the other. And so perhaps some evils are like that. They're joined with goods such that if the world were missing the evil, it would also be missing the corresponding good. And since God wanted the world to exhibit this particular good, he had no choice but to create a world that had that kind of evil as well. Now, you might think this objection is no good for the following reason. You might think, but wait a minute. God is supposed to be a being of all power. God is an all-powerful being. God is omnipotent. He can do anything. And if that's true, then he should be able to create these goods without evils. After all, he's God. God can do anything. Now, this is a really interesting reply to this objection. But it turns out that it's not going to be a successful response to the argument from evil. Let me try to explain why. The crucial question is whether or not God can do the impossible. Now, this is something that theologians and philosophers have debated for millennia. Some thinkers are tempted to say that God could do something even if it's impossible. Perhaps Descartes held a view like this. But other thinkers, most notably Thomas Aquinas, think that God's powers are restricted, if you will, to the domain of possibility. Now that doesn't mean that God is not omnipotent. God can literally do anything that's possible. And if you say, but couldn't God do more? Couldn't God also do what's impossible? Someone like Aquinas wants to say, there's no thing out there to be done. Anything that's doable, God can do. Things that are, aren't doable are nonsense. And so there's a certain kind of dilemma for someone who wants to offer this reply to this objection. And the dilemma is this. If God's power is restricted to doing what's possible, 
then it seems like an objection like this will work to the argument from evil. Because as long as there really are some goods that are impossible to get without evil or the possibility of evil, then it's not up to God whether to create a world that has the good and not the evil. It's just not something that he can do. On the other hand, if you think, well, maybe we should understand God's potentiality, God's omnipotence, in terms of the impossible. God can do the possible, and God can do what's impossible. If you think about it that way, this objection to the argument from evil won't work. But then again, the argument from evil won't work either, and here's why. Remember, the argument from evil was trying to look at features of our world and show that they were inconsistent with the existence of God. But now wait a minute. If God can do things that are impossible, then it seems nothing will be inconsistent with the existence of God. On that way of thinking about it, you would look around the world and say, there's evil in the world. And the theist should say, yes. And the atheist might say, but you couldn't have evil in the world if there was a God. And the theist will say, yes. And the atheist will say, so there's no God. And the theist will say, no. Because remember, you told me even God could do what was impossible. And if it's impossible for God to create a world filled with evils, then the fact that God created a world full of evils doesn't show that he's not there. God can do what's impossible. So it seems that we, doesn't, we don't have to reconcile this particular issue about whether God can do the impossible. If he can't, then it seems that this is a good objection to the first premise of that argument. If God can do what's impossible, then this objection fails, but then of course God could just create a world full of evils, even though it's impossible for him to do so. Either way, this version of the argument from evil won't work. But we can do better. We can strengthen this first version of the argument from evil in a way that dodges this objection about goods being necessary um, or evils being necessary for some evils. Here's what the second version of the argument looks like. So I'm just calling this the argument from evil version two. Premise one and two are slightly changed. What we can do is we can now just not talk about the existence of any old evil, but we could talk about the existence of pointless evils. A pointless evil is an evil that doesn't serve some greater purpose. Remember, the objection that we just considered said, even God would allow evils in the world so long as they were bound with some good or made possible some good, as long as there was some kind of compensating benefit. But now we can say, look, we grant the possibility that God would allow an evil if it really did secure some greater good. But as the second premise of this argument points out, that is not what the vast majority of the evils in our world look like. So the idea is, if God exists, there would be no pointless evil in the world. In other words, whatever evil there is always serves some kind of greater purpose. But, premise two, there does seem to be an awful lot of pointless evil in the world. Bad things that happen, for which we can see no obvious connection to anything good. And the conclusion of this argument, just like the first version, is that God does not exist. So now we've strengthened this argument from evil to dodge the principal objection that God might create a world with evil as long as that evil produces a compensating good. What do you think about this version of the argument? Is this better than the first? Is this argument sound? It is valid. If the two premises are true, the conclusion again follows by a matter of logic. So our only question to decide is whether both of these assumptions are, in fact, true. So I invite you to pause the video, take a look, and consider, is this a good argument? So what do you think? This argument appears stronger than the first version, but is it strong enough that we should consider this a sound argument? Is this argument a good enough reason to leave being an agnostic and decide to be an atheist when it comes to God? There are three major responses that philosophers have offered to this style of argument. Here's the first. 
Perhaps there's no hard line in our world in which evils are required for goods. Let me try to explain what I mean. Suppose you're a judge and suppose you're giving a sentence to a prisoner. This is an example taken from a philosopher by the name of Peter Van Inwagen at Notre Dame. As a judge, you're trying to match the punishment with the crime. Maybe you think a just punish is one that gives the person what she's due. Maybe you think it's one that reforms the person in a certain way, or whatever. Now imagine that a just sentence is 10 years. And imagine that as you give this sentence to the prisoner, she stands up and says, but judge, don't you think that there's no real difference between a punishment of nine years, 364 days, and a punishment of 10 years? In other words, judge, don't you think it's true that one day more in prison won't make a difference in my being reformed or in my getting what I deserve or whatever? No, it's almost certain that the answer to that question is yes. It's not as if the, pr the prisoner deserves exactly 10 years, no more, no less. The judge is picking an arbitrary date to try to give the prisoner what it is she's due. But it's truly arbitrary. One day won't make a difference. And so by that line of reasoning, the judge ought to sentence her to nine years, 364 days. But of course, the problem is the prisoner can now raise her hand and say, but judge, by your own reasoning, one day doesn't make a difference. So instead of nine years, 364 days, how about nine years and 363 days? And so on. The big picture is this. There is some kind of good to be achieved reform, retribution, whatever. But it's arbitrary where that line is. A good judge, even the best judge, is going to have to make an arbitrary call. And it will be arbitrary in just the sense that there will be days of punishment or forms of punishment or types of punishment that will be truly arbitrary. They'll be pointless. That one last day won't actually be necessary to secure this greater good. It's going to include at least some pointless days, no matter where the good judge draws the line for the fine, the time in prison, or what have you. But then, by this reasoning, premise one in the argument that we just looked at is still mistaken. It's not true that the existence of God is sufficient to eliminate all pointless evil. Like a good judge, God's going to have to make arbitrary calls. Perhaps there are some goods in our world that require some evils, and there's no hard line as to where those evils need to end to secure the kind of plan or the kind of goods that God has. And if so, we should expect to find a world where there are some bad things that happen such that those bad things were, as particular bad things, truly pointless we could have removed them from the world and still had whatever range of goods it was that God was trying to produce. But if that's right, the mere existence of pointless evils alone won't be enough to get us a good argument for atheism. Now, of course, the defender of the argument from evil could respond as follows. Okay, fine. Maybe in principle there are some pointless evils that are compatible with the existence of God, but not as many as we see in our world. And this actually raises the question of whether or not we can tell how many of the evils in our world are truly pointless. Hold that thought for the third objection. Take a look at the second objection. The second objection is that, as a matter of fact, no evil in the world is pointless. So in other words, this has been probably the most popular response to this kind of argument from evil for the last couple of millennia. Christian thinkers and Muslim thinkers and Jewish thinkers try to identify features of the world that are really good, but which would disappear if we lacked the kind of evils that we see in our world. In other words, they look around the world and they don't see evils that are pointless. They see evils that play an essential role in some kind of bigger plan. They see the evils that we experience not as being pointless or gratuitous, but as being necessary or required for some greater purpose. So I invite you to think about that for a moment. Can you think of 
goods in our world that you think would disappear if we didn't have the kind of evils in our world? How might our world be impoverished without the evils that we experience? What good things do you think evil might be getting us? I invite you to think about that for a moment. What do you think? Do you think the evils in our world are required for compensating goods? This project, the project of trying to think of evils and trying to explain them in a way that they're connected with goods, is what philosophers call a theodicy. A theodicy is, in the words of Milton, an attempt to explain the ways of God to man. Let me walk through a few of the most popular explanations for evil. Here are five theodicies. The first says simply that the existence of any good whatsoever requires evil. The idea here is that good and evil are logical counterparts. They're just like the mountain and the valley. And this is true not just for some goods, but it's true for all goods. Good and bad are something like a yin and a yang. They're logically paired so that having the one requires having the other. Now historically there have been religious groups that think about good and evil in that way. The Manichees were um, believers in a kind of duality of good and evil, a divine evil force and divine good force that are somehow struggling with one another but always on a par. But at least this isn't how traditional theists have thought about good and evil at least within the major theodicies of the world, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, the thought is that God is a self-sufficient being who existed all by himself at some point. That God doesn't need an evil twin in order to exist. That at one point there was just God or there was just a creation and everything was good. And that evil only entered the picture later. So while it's open to a theist to try to explain goods and evils this way, it sure doesn't mesh well with the way people have historically thought about good and evil. And plus it seems strange to think that all goods require an evil. Think of the good of enjoying a glass of beer or the good of a conversation with a friend. It's not at all clear that there's some evil that's required for that good to exist. We could imagine perfectly well a world in which there were beers or conversations and not the kind of evils that we see in this world. So this theodicy has a long uproad hill to make good on its claim that all goods require evil. It's probably better and more feasible to think that just certain kinds of good require evil and that maybe our world is populated by all of those different kinds. Here's an example. This second objection says that recognizing or appreciating the good requires evil. And the idea here is that if our world were just filled with good things, you maybe wouldn't notice it. The idea is that fish don't necessarily recognize the water they're in because it's everywhere and part of their world. We recognize water because we exist on two different planes, outside of water, and then we can submerge ourselves in water. The same for good and evil. Maybe good could exist without evil, in tension with the first objection, but if it did, we wouldn't recognize it. So God allows our world to have evil things so that we can recognize and appreciate Him and those good things. Now, something about this theodicy seems plausible. It does seem like we wouldn't recognize the good or appreciate the good as much as we do if our world didn't have absences of the good or examples of things that are evil. But it's not clear that introducing these kinds of evils justifies those kinds of goods. In other words, those goods seem to be so small that they don't outweigh the badness of some of the evil that we see in the world. For example, consider a father who thinks that his daughter just doesn't appreciate having good arms. So he breaks one of his daughter's arms. And you ask him, what a horrible thing. Why would you break your daughter's arm? And his response is, well, she wasn't really appreciating having good strong arms. <laughs> 
and she will after this experience. He's probably right that she didn't appreciate her health and having strong arms in the way that she will after being injured in this way. But that doesn't at all justify doing that kind of thing to his daughter. And one wonders whether the same is true of God. Maybe it's true that we wouldn't appreciate good as much if the world weren't full of things like Ebola and AIDS and holocausts and murders and kidnappings, etc. But do the existence of those things justify our recognition or our appreciation of the good? That seems far-fetched. How about the third objection? The third objection says that free will requires evil. Or at the very least, free will requires the possibility of evil. If God wanted to have beings who were genuinely free, then it wasn't up to God to ensure that the world lacked evil. If you give people choice, inevitably, they're going to make mistakes, they're going to make bad choices, and those bad choices will result in evil things. So, the good is free will, or significant free choice, and the evil is this possibility that humans will abuse their free choice. That sometimes they'll choose poorly in ways that harm fellow humans, fellow creatures, and so on. This has been one of the most famous theodicies and responses to the argument from evil over the last few hundred years. And it's sometimes called the free will theodicy. But is it right? Well, there's a couple questions you might want to ask yourself. One. Is being free that really good? Is it really a good thing to be free? Is it so good that it's worth things like the Holocaust? You might think, look, it was a good thing for Adolf Hitler to be free. But it wasn't so good that it was worth the lives of millions of victims. Second thing you might ask yourself, why couldn't God have given us free will, if it's this really good thing, but then just make us better at using it. Couldn't God have made us smarter, kinder, more empathetic? Couldn't he have made us the kind of beings that are better at exercising our free will than we actually are? It seems like he could have done that, and it seems like we would still be free. And so it's not clear that this theodicy is going to explain the kind of evil we see in the world. And last, it's not clear that the free will theodicy will explain the types, the full range of the types of evils that we experience in the world. And that's because while some of the evil that happens in our world is the result of what humans do or what humans should have done but failed to do, climate change might be an example, but evil is also the result of natural disasters, the kind of human and animal suffering that happens as a result of earthquakes, famines, tsunamis, and so forth. In other words, the free will theodicy might help in explaining some of the evils that we experience, but it's very hard to see how it explains all the evils on Earth. At least some of those evils, so-called natural evils, don't seem to be nicely explained by this theodicy. And so we're still left wondering why our world contains the evil things that it does. Look at the fourth objection. The fourth objection says that character building requires evil. The thought here is that sometimes you must go through hard times or bad things or thin times in order to generate a kind of moral virtue or character. To be brave, one has to experience scary things and work through it. To learn perseverance, you have to endure hard times to try to build your own character. And there seems to be something praiseworthy about the person who's worked through trials and difficult circumstances to become a better and a stronger person, as opposed to a person who is just somehow made that way by another. And so the thought is, God wants us to build our own characters. Some some philosophers call this soul crafting. God wants us to work on our own lives and for us to be sympathetic, for us to be kind, for us to be generous, for us to be courageous. There has to be a world in which people need sympathy, people need generosity, 
where there are scary things that require courage. If you make the world into this perfect heaven-like park, no one will ever develop the kind of moral virtues they need, and hence they'll be deficient in an important way. Now this objection seems to have something going for it. It does seem right that character is a really important thing. And it does seem right that a world devoid of hard times would be a world in which it's very difficult for us to craft our own souls, develop our own virtues. But again, like the free will theodicy, it's not at all clear that this is going to explain all of the evils that we see in the world. For example, what about little children who die horrible deaths early on before there's any chance for character building? Think of the many young children sense. It's not as if they have a trial that they can overcome and learn to develop virtue. They're literally annihilated by the kinds of evil that we experience in the world. And so it's not clear that the existence of that evil is justified by some appeal to character building. Last objection. Historically, many theists have thought that the evil in our world could be explained, could be justified, by appeal to something like punishment. Bad things happen in the world to give people what they deserve. In particular, particular Hindu versions of theism might invoke something like karma to explain the bad things that happen in the world. Why do innocent people suffer? Well, they're not actually innocent. They're getting their due rewards for things that happened earlier or in another life. And so the evil in our world is serving a purpose. It's serving the purpose of getting people what they deserve. Maybe not from this life, maybe from an earlier life, but still, the idea is that the evils that we experience are not pointless. They're giving people their just desserts. And since it's always fair and morally okay to give people what they deserve, it's fair and okay for God to allow those people to experience evil. Now again, there are many ways you might object to this theodicy. One is that it's not clear that there's any evidence for anything like an earlier life, and you would need that to explain why bad things happen to little children and so forth. But enough with theodicies. Let's turn to the third set of responses, the third way of objecting to this last argument from evil. Now this third objection to the argument from evil doesn't try to quibble about whether or not there's a fine line between evils that are pointless and those that are not. And it doesn't try to do what a theodicy does. Namely, it doesn't try to explain the kind of evils that we see in the world. This is not a theodicy. This last response is a kind of skeptical response. And the skeptical response grants, on the one hand, that a lot of the evils that we see in the world seem pointless. There's a lot of evils for which we don't see what greater purpose it might serve. But on the other hand, the skeptical response says, but the fact that they seem pointless to me is paltry evidence for the conclusion that they really are pointless. In other words, this skeptical response remains neutral about the truth of the second premise of the argument from evil that we just considered. It says we're in no position to tell whether or not evils in our world are genuinely pointless. And if we're in no such position, then we shouldn't affirm the second premise in that argument. And hence, we shouldn't endorse this argument from evil. Now there are several different reasons why philosophers have offered a kind of skepticism about pointless evils. First, some philosophers have used analogies to try to motivate or explain this kind of skepticism. Let me give you an example. Suppose you were watching a chess match between two chess masters. And suppose you know something about chess, but not an awful lot, certainly much less than these two masters. Suppose you see one of them make a particular move. And from your vantage point, you don't see why he would have made that move. In other words, the move seems pointless to you. Should you conclude on that basis that the move really was pointless? That the chess master had no reason for making that move? Of course not. That seems really silly. The fact that you can't see a reason isn't a good reason to think that there is no such reason. Or consider another example. 
the analogy between children and parents. Oftentimes, parents act in certain ways that children can't understand. From the children's point of view, certain things look pointless or gratuitous or reasonless. Why on earth would my mother behave in such a way or my father do such a thing? But again, it seems unreasonable for the child to reason this way. I can't see a reason, therefore my dad must not have actually had a reason. Again, from the child's vantage point, she's just not in a position to see what kind of reasons there are. And some theists have thought we should say the same thing about us and God. Given our epistemic position and God's epistemic position, it's not at all surprising that see things might seem pointless to us, even though God ultimately has a reason for them. Another way you might defend a kind of skeptical response to arguments from evil is to endorse a kind of attention, if you will, to long-term consequences. The example of so-called butterfly effects in our world. Sometimes really small events have a kind of domino effect to trigger really large-scale events down the road. Your staying home one day or choosing a college might affect who you marry and who your kids are, and down the road, whether or not cancer is cured, and so forth. Let me give you a kind of silly but telling example from the philosophical literature on this particular point. Suppose that Lady Churchill, Winston Churchill's father, had slept on her right side instead of her left side on the night in which Winston Churchill was conceived. Well, knowing what we know about hum the human reproductive system, if she had slept on one side rather than another, it's plausible that a different sperm would have made it first to her egg. And as a result, she would have had a different child and not Winston Churchill. And if Winston Churchill had not been born, World War II would have gone very differently. Maybe even the Nazis would have conquered the United Kingdom. And if World War II had gone radically different, then there's no telling how different the world could be today. So while silly, it's an example of how something that seems very trivial to us, whether you sleep on your right side or your left side, might have dramatic impacts down the road. And once we start paying attention to things like butterfly effects and long-term consequences, we should be very skeptical of our ability to tell whether any given thing that we do ultimately bears long-term good fruit or bad fruit, whether or not it ultimately has some kind of long-term justification. Now the third reason that you might take a kind of skeptical response to the argument from evil is because you might endorse a kind of epistemic principle about when absences of evils are truly evidenced by nothingness or by absences. And here's a kind of principle of the sort that I have in mind in objection number three. You might think a lack of evidence for something is evidence for that thing not being there only if you would likely see it if it were there. Let me give you an example. Take a look at your hands. You don't see any germs on your hands. At least you don't if your eyesight is like mine. But it would be silly to conclude from that that there are no germs on your hand. Why? Because you know full well that if there were germs, you wouldn't see them. In other words, you're not seeing them isn't good evidence that they're not there. But if you look around the room and you see no elephants, then you're not seeing elephants is good evidence that there are no elephants in the room. Why? Because you would have seen them if they were there. So now ask yourself this. Take some given evil in the world. Suppose there were some kind of compensating good down the road for that evil. Do you think you're likely to see that compensating good if it were there? If so, then that compensating good is more like the elephant than the germ. But a lot of philosophers think, you know, humans just don't know very much about the kind of goods that there are, the kinds of evils that there are, and the kinds of connections between goods and evils we're not in a good position to tell whether or not the evils in our world are pointless. And if not, we shouldn't endorse the second premise in this argument from evil. We should be skeptical about it.
So again, it's not that we can explain these evils, and it's not that they don't seem pointless. They do seem pointless. But the fact that they seem pointless to us isn't good evidence that they really are pointless, says the skeptical responder. Now, of course, there are objections to dealing with the problem of evil this way, just as there are objections to the theodicy. Here are the three of the, three of the most poignant objections to this kind of skepticism. First, you might think that it requires a kind of ethical consequentialism. In other words, you might think that this kind of skeptical response requires you to say that the ends justify the means. That as long as God gets enough good stuff out of a rape or a kidnapping or a murder, then it was okay for him to allow it. And many philosophers think that that kind of moral theory is not tenable. They think that there, look, there are just some things that are so bad or so wrong that they're never justifiable. There are some things that, if you will, are absolute moral prohibitions. And some philosophers think that this kind of skepticism runs afoul of that ethical commitment. Another objection that some people have to this kind of skepticism about the argument from evil is that it might undercut certain kind of theistic commitments. So theists, people who are interested in seeing this argument from evil fail, might also believe in things like the reliability of religious experiences or divine revelation in the form of the Quran or the Bible or the Torah or whatever. But look, if you're skeptical about God in a very deep way, if you think, for example, God might have reasons that we know nothing about and so we're not able to reason about how God would act in the world, then that seems like it undercuts your trust in whether the religious experience you had was genuine or whether or not you should trust a particular book of Revelation. After all, maybe God had reasons to trick you about particular things, reasons that are justified in the end. And you might not know about those reasons, just as a child doesn't know about the reasons of her parents. And so maybe it's not reasonable for you to trust God in that way after all. So while the skeptical response might work to block an argument from evil, it might also block things that theists want to hang on to. Last objection. And this is perhaps the most serious to a kind of skeptical response to the argument from evil. Some philosophers think that this kind of skepticism yields a kind of moral paralysis. It blocks your ability to deliberate about moral matters. Let me give you an example. Suppose you and your friend, who happens to be skeptical about the argument from evil in this way, are taking a walk in the woods. And suppose you come across a pond and a young boy is drowning. And you say, quick, we must help this child. And your friend, who's skeptical, says, but wait a minute. Maybe God has a plan that requires this boy to drown. After all, we can't tell what kind of goods are in the world, evils in the world, what kind of connections there are between evils and, and goods. And the fact that we can't see how saving this boy would be bad doesn't show that it isn't really bad for us to save this boy. And so, we shouldn't rush in and save him despite the fact that it seems like that, that's what we ought to do on its face. The idea is being skeptical about morality in this way might undercut our ability to make our own ethical choices and moral choices in our everyday lives. Now, of course, just as with the theodicies, these responses are contentious, and philosophers debate whether or not these kind of objections are ultimately successful. But that's your job. Think about this last argument from evil that we considered. Is it a good reason to leverage ourselves out of the agnostic position and into the atheistic position? Remember, no one's born an atheist. We need evidence. We need a reason to move out of the agnostic camp and into the, ag the atheistic camp. Do you think the existence of evil in our world is a good reason to move from being agnostic to an atheist? If you don't think it's a good reason, why? Are one of the objections that we've considered here correct? If so, which one? I leave that to you to decide.